Welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 169. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons. And as always, I'm joined by a man who never splits the difference. It's Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. It is an, another exciting episode, number 169, that you and I are digging into with our listeners. And as a reminder, we're in the third episode of our most recent Mindset series, aren't we? Mate, we are deep into the mindset reconfiguration mode, and I think we're about to unleash some serious mindset voodoo today, Mark. Yeah, voodoo is certainly one way of putting it. Today, listeners, we are digging in number 169 into Chris Voss's Never Split the Difference, Negotiating as If Your Life Depended on It. Mike, this is a book that I, I've been aware of prior to digging into for the Moonshot Show. As you know, I even utilized some of the tactics and lessons for a project <laughs> that we had, I think maybe a year and a half ago, a couple of years ago, some and really valuable things. It did. It totally it worked. worked. And now, I, I think we do want to say one thing, though, just quickly before all of our moonshotters think, what are we, what are we doing a show on negotiation for? That sounds a bit cheap and nasty. I think we gotta, we've got to say, hey, before you press stop, give this a go, try it out because never split the difference may be about negotiation, but I think it's about much more than negotiation, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think where we've seen already within our mindset series, starting with Mark Manson's The Subtle Art of Not Giving a <laughs> or if you want to find out what that whistle is, just go and listen to the show. <laughs> we we learned about the idea of of values and meaning, didn't we? And yeah. Last week's show with Robert Green, The 48 Laws of Power, it was about the idea of ownership, control, and the reality that you might have of the world. So already we're starting to build these, these essential building blocks of mindset. With Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference, like you say, yeah, it is on paper a book about negotiating and understanding from a genuine FBI hostage negotiator, new ways to approach maybe difficult conversations. I think where you and I are seeing the value in Chris Voss's Never Split the Difference is actually the, the elemental values that exist within honing and cultivating a good skill in communication, talking to mm. one another in order to understand the core principle or the core vision of the other person in order to both come out with a fair result, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and we have we have learned um, it's very important um, when you're trying to agree something uh, with a counterparty that there is a true fairness and equity in the agreement because if it is unfair, then you know down the track the counterparty who didn't get a fair deal is not going to live up to the deal Anyway, they're going to try and pull out of the deal. So if you push beyond what might be considered negotiation tactics, and they're pretty good tactics, and he was an FBI hostage negotiator. So, I mean, we're getting good <laughs> quality tactics here. I think beyond the idea of negotiation, what it really is, is it's about alignment and connection with the people around you. It's about agreeing fair terms to work together to a mutual outcome so we can have uh, success for each other, for ourselves, and for the mission as a whole. In fact, what Chris Voss makes the case for is life is just one entire negotiation. And today on our show, we're going to get right into it. And Mark, there's so many tactics um, that we're going to go through on the show so you'll be able to get better agreements, uh, better uh, negotiations with your peers, your colleagues, perhaps even your better half. So Mark, where do we want to start this adventure with Chris Voss? Well, one of the main ways that some of our listeners could be, uh, have awareness or knowledge of Chris Voss is actually through one of the platforms that he's on. So obviously he's got his book, Never Split the Difference, that's already out there, but he also has what's called a masterclass that's available online. And Masterclass, for those listeners who aren't aware, it's a great online um, platform with many, many different, uh, a huge catalog, huge library of well-known individuals breaking down their skills into easy to digest uh, 
and bite-sized pieces of information. So there's a great platform called uh, Masterclass. We'll put a link into the show notes in case you want to go and check it out. Chris Voss has created a class all about negotiation based on his book, Never Split the Difference. So what I thought, Mike, would be a quite nice introduction to Chris Voss, as well as his way of thinking, is actually to hear from the trailer of Masterclass. So this is the trailer for Masterclass and Chris Voss's class on negotiation. Everything in life is a negotiation. When you cross the street is a negotiation. Getting your coffee at Starbucks is a negotiation. You're probably in three to seven negotiations every single day. Your life could be in a completely different place just by improving how you negotiate. Negotiators are working around the clock. The deadline for execution has passed. With us now to help break down the investigation, FBI Special Agent Hostage Negotiator, Christopher Voss. My role as a hostage negotiator was to connect authentically with the victim, the victim's family, and with the hostage taker. Everybody really deserves to have somebody hear what they have to say. In my masterclass, I'm going to give you all the strategies and tactics that I developed as one of the top hostage negotiators in the world. You're going to learn everything from bargaining to reading body language to the neuroscience that you can use to literally bend people's reality. You know, negotiation is letting the other side have your way. So mirroring creates the opportunity for them actually to present you with your deal, only they thought it was their idea. It's just a simple repetition of the last one to three words of what somebody said. We've got the actual recording from the Chase Manhattan Bank robbery hostage taking. We've got a van out here. Know anything about it? You crazy? Chase my driver away. We chased your driver away. My training was to mirror. And the bank robber started blurting out stuff that he had no intention of saying. People love to be mirrored. They love to be encouraged to go on. These skills help you improve your life. Sometimes people say to me, these tools are just manipulation. It's about win-lose. That is not the case. Great negotiation is about great collaboration. Why does it matter to you that you should get better at negotiation? Because however your life is now, you can do better. I'm Chris Voss, and this is my masterclass. Well, that was a bit of a pump up. I'm Mike Parsons, and this is Moonshots. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we should introduce the show from now on, Mike. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, let's do a re edit. <laughs> so, so, Mark, here, what I'm hearing, like a key thing that jumped out to me right there. Great, uh, great collaboration, big theme mm. of what he's talking about. And I love how he specifically goes after this is not about win-lose, this is about win-win, this is about great collaboration. I think, you know, looking at this a bit differently, he's giving us just the means to articulate ourselves and understand the person that we are working with, coming out to a mutually beneficial agreement. And I think all of the tactics that we're going to break down in this show are just a means of doing that. So I think um, if we sort of get over how we might have presumed negotiation and these sort of maybe people think of them a bit as like sales tactics, you know, actually this is about very universal themes of, uh, of the Moonshots model. It's about empathy, collaboration, uh, understanding the people around you. And these are just means to do so. Like, let me make the argument for you, Mark. You don't turn up to business just wearing a pair of shorts, no shoes and no top. You put on nice clothes that reflect the person you want to be. So surely that's not seen as some sort of cheap sales trick. No, you just want to look good and look professional. So why wouldn't you, in your conversation techniques, use professional techniques that help you to understand the person that you're talking with, to collaborate with them, and to get a great outcome? To me, it's just the same thing. What do you think, Mark? Well, I think it's reflecting the theme that we found within this most, uh, within this mindset series, Mike, which is we are learning these, let's call them tactics, or, or at least ways of thinking, that we don't spend enough time really learning or digging into before going out and giving it a go. So as you were just saying, you don't end up in a boardroom without shorts or without a shirt or sandals on, you know, <laughs> maybe that does close the deal. I don't know, but you know it what I mean, do. huh? It might do <laughs> because you go in a little bit more prepared. 
And where I think Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference, comes in is it is preparing us to have better conversations in order to reach that fair or mutual outcome Mm. where the perception from both sides is positive and therefore there's no animosity or frustration going forward. I would argue that none of us really have the opportunity to spend a lot of time on improving our, let's call it communication strategy prior to actually picking up a book or picking up a masterclass and diving in deep. These aren't skills that are necessarily taught to us early in our careers or our lives. And I think that that's a missed opportunity, isn't it? Much like with Mark Manson and the idea of understanding our values, Mm -hmm. that's Mm -hmm. not something that we spend a lot of time on. And I think the same is true here, whether you Mm. call it negotiation or let's just call it communication. Exactly. it's, It's not something that we really spend time on. And I think that's where Chris Voss's book really fits into the Moonshots library. I think, yes, I'm, I'm visualizing that library right now. It's going to be, get quite big just by the way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's 170 books in there so far. So um, <laughs> I think that sounds like a pretty good library. I think, so now that we've kind of set that bigger frame, I think we've got four different techniques coming up in this show, whether it's tactical empathy, value proposition, holding attention, mirroring, We're going to explain how you can use these to to understand, to connect and to collaborate with the people that are around you in your professional or your purpose, uh, personal life. It's all in front of you here on the Moonshot Show. But I tell you who else is getting in the conversation and that's our members, Mark. I think we are just so grateful for their continued support. Um, it's becoming quite a long list and that's a good thing uh, because if we have 50,000 listeners, we've still got about another 49,900 to go uh, to yeah. become members. But Mark, look, let's tip the hat. Let's, uh, let's do the roll call for our Patreon members. Absolutely. I'm starting to see new faces every single week. So Patreon members, thank you for joining us as part of the Moonshots family. And please, everybody, give a stand-up ovation to Bob, Niles, John, Terry, Bridie, and Niall, Marjolin, Ken, Dietmar, Tom, Byron, Mark, and Marjan, Connor, Rodrigo, Yasmin, and Spaceman, Daniela, Lisa, Sid, Maria, Paul, Berg, and Kalman. I mean, Mike, when we get closer to that 50,000, I think uh, we're going to have to dedicate an entire show just to read out <laughs> the members' names. Already, we take up a good proportion of each show, calling totally. out our favorite individuals. So, everybody, thank you. Here's your lunar powered dose of thanks and good karma. Thank you for helping us keep the moonshots lights on. Yeah. And just to explain why we really uh, need your membership, I mean, just, just so you all understand, we pay. 24 US dollars a month for our transcription software. So over the course of a year, it's over $250 just for our transcription software. And then we have all our podcast hosting software, which is not cheap either, which is actually more than this because we have so many listeners. And all of these costs are what your membership goes to support and help us to provide this show to you. So if you're enjoying the show as you're listening, just jump over to Patreon, become a member. It's literally, it's one coffee for a whole month of membership in the Moonshots uh, podcast. And when you become a member of Moonshots, you also get access to the Moonshots Master Series. And we just published one of those, didn't we, Mark? We did. We, we well, In fact, we were about to just publish um, a brand new show. Oh, no, it is live, in fact, today uh, it, on all about finding your purpose. I mean, Mike, this is the perfect connection, I think, to the series that we're currently looking into, isn't it? On mindset, finding your purpose. We've got lessons around Ikigai. Um, we've got clips from Kyle Maynard, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, Simon Sinek. I mean, that show was... That master series was pretty enormous. It was it was pretty enormous, I would agree. And don't forget, it's not just uh, finding your purpose. We've done communication, circle of influence, habits, 90-minute masterclasses where we bring together the world's best thinkers. We decode them. You get lots of show notes and frameworks and templates, and all of that is available to you if you become a member. So head over to moonshots.io, click on the big member button, jump on in, be part of it, join the conversation. We would love you to be there. So now, Mark, 
are you ready? Are you ready to explore what tactical empathy looks like and feels like? Are you ready? I mean, this is the broad appeal of the book, isn't it? Uh, as, as Chris Voss would break down, this is one of the core uh, columns or DNA essentials of his book, Never Split the Difference. So Mike, without any further ado, let's hear from Chris Voss. Introduce us to what he calls tactical empathy. All right. So what do you do if you're armed with this tactical empathy from hostage negotiation after you leave the FBI and you're looking for gainful employment? How do you find a real job? And you write a book. <laughs> I wrote the book, Never Split the Difference, with Tall Roz and Brandon Voss about applying the tactical empathy from hostage negotiation to the bullies and the liars that we encounter every day, to the bad, the mad, and the sad we run into in our jobs, in our social interactions, at our family gatherings. At the breakfast table. I saw a meme recently. I thought it was really funny. It said, you know, this parenting is really wearing me out. I think I'll try something less stressful, like being a hostage negotiator. (laughs) Tactical empathy. Weapons grade empathy. Did you ever imagine hearing those two words combined in the same sentence? It never split the difference. We define tactical empathy as simply taking an inventory of the perspective of the person you're talking to, to the advers- of the adversary, the counterpart, especially the parts that we don't like, and then telling them what it is, describing them back to them calmly. No denials, no disagreements, calmly. Now, tactical empathy works because we all possess this human nature wiring. It works on a human nature level. We've got something in our brains called the limbic system. Everybody has it. It's components of the brain. It doesn't matter what your gender, your ethnicity, or where you grew up. You have a limbic system, and everyone has that. That's the reason every hostage negotiation team in the world, from Baghdad to Bogota to Boston, uses the same skills because it's human nature wiring that we all possess. Now, that's its shortcoming. It only works with people. Only works with people. Yeah, empathy is, has just been such a big part of our discovery doing the show together, right? Yeah, it, it is arguably one of the biggest ideas or the uh, kind of beating heart, so to speak, of Chris's book. And in fact, I'll just read out, Mike, the way that he describes it is it brings your attention to both the emotional obstacles and the potential pathways to getting an agreement done. And as Chris was uh, Chris Voss was calling out in that clip we've just heard that getting an agreement done can be anywhere between a boardroom, a hostage negotiation, or even the dinner table with your family. It is something. <laughs> it's something that exists everywhere, doesn't it? Yeah, and and so let's kind of see how we can process this and put it into place. Um, you know, some classic things that come to my mind is. Um, you know, if you want to deploy some empathy in, uh, let's say, a, a professional discussion um, where there's some sort of negotiation of terms happening, it's just to shut up and listen. Um, I think that's like yeah. a really good uh, um, starting point. And then something else that we've learned a lot in the Moonshots podcast is um, really actively listen. So put your phone away, really focus on the person that's speaking, and really try and understand the context, where are they coming from? And, you know, I often find that when people take an unusual uh, point of view in a discussion, you know, someone explained it to me like this. I thought it was really good that people are often fighting today a battle they had yesterday. Yeah. I like like that. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And what they mean is like they are having a negotiation with you today today based on some mistake or pain or problem they had in the past with someone else. So it's actually not about you. It's not even about today. It was about somebody else yesterday, but it's manifesting in the conversation today. So having those sorts of insights can really help you go, oh, I see. They've had a really bad uh, experience doing a project like this. So that's why they're just completely not open to it. But it, it is actually a very good a path for for us right now, but you have to go deal with that concern before you can actually agree to anything going forward. So I think like this 
listening, just active listening, looking for the context of the person. I mean, what a strong um, point to remind us of. If we want a great outcome to a negotiation, how about starting with listening rather than hammering home your points? Yeah, absolutely. Because how many times have we ourselves been influenced by something that's happened in the past? Like you say, a bad project can then create associations in your in your memory system and your mind when you go into a brand new relationship, right? Mm. So if you had a really bad um, bit of production work or whatever it might be, and then you're going into a new partnership, your assumption could be that you'll experience the same problems. And that's unfair on the new party, isn't it? Because they don't know. Yeah. <laughs> they don't know the, the struggles that you might have had. Exactly. And like you say, the act of listening allows the new party to understand or maybe try to uh, try to understand those frustrations or pains that the new party ha- has had. You're right. Mm. I think it's um, just a great reminder to take the time to listen, to understand. And, you know, I think the more that you kind of do that act of listening, understanding, and not trying to think about your points, but trying to think about where they are coming from, I think the path in any negotiation or agreement sort of starts to reveal itself, doesn't it? Once you kind of, oh, I get it. Now I now I understand where they're coming from. Don't you think that you the solution tends to make itself obvious, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I think to build on the on the listening piece, once you start to listen and understand or hear what that party is saying, I think you can almost try to replicate or put yourself in their shoes hmm. and understand or imagine that you are that person. So you can start thinking, okay, I understand why they're frustrated about this situation. What happens if I was in that situation? Right. Well, I might take it out on them. I might be a little bit guarded about my true intentions because I want to see if they figure it out on themselves. Well, and Well, let's go a, a, bit, a bit further. Maybe they don't realize they're fighting a previous battle and you can help them say, hey, I understand that's what happened in the past, but it doesn't have to happen this time. Exactly. Exactly. You can help them see if you understand the, the benefits of um, – labeling pain or frustrations Mm -hmm. to listening, active listening, as you call out, then you can help that party transcend over that, that border or boundary that currently exists in their minds. Can't you, you can help them by knowing the communication skills that we're learning from Chris Voss in never split the difference. We, we can assist those other partners or other relationships in order to push things forward proactively. Totally. Totally. Now, another part of, his framework. And we're going to have links to all of these. So head over to moonshots.io. If you're really interested in any of this, just jump into the show notes. We'll have complete links, listings, you name it, all the good stuff, plus a transcript of the entire show. Um, But this next one we're going to get into is about your value proposition and the role that it plays in a conversation. And so this is a really interesting technique in really the early stages of a conversation when you're trying to work out how you can help each other. So let's listen now to Mr. Chris Voss talking about how to and when to reveal your value proposition. Before the book came out, we'd be standing up in front of a group and I'd say, guys, why listen to a hostage negotiator? And what happens? What do you think happens? Why would you listen to a hostage negotiator? Why would you? Because your skills have to work. Your skills have to work is what he said. Here's what happens on the people that haven't made up their mind yet. They tell you which part of your value proposition appeals to them. I could say you should listen to a hostage negotiator because my skills have to work. Or I can look at you and say, why would you do this? And you say the same thing. Now, when does it matter more to you? When you say it. And I begin to understand what aspect. Now, if, if, 
uh, he's a potential client. I said, why would you ever listen to a hostage negotiator? And he says to me, because your skills have to work. Now I use that to continually frame my value proposition because I know that's an element of my value proposition and those are the words that speak to him. And if their mind is 80% made up ahead of time, you have to diagnose what aspects of what you bring to the table matter to them. Because more than likely, every single one of you have anywhere from 10 to 20 reasons why people should do business with you. And if you start out on stuff that doesn't matter to me, how long before I tune you out? Five seconds is a pretty accurate guess. It's roughly three to 10 seconds. Some data says seven seconds. But you're going to blow five, seven, ten seconds on a wrong issue, and I'm going to tune you out. I mean, and there's no shortage. I don't know how many of you have been in pitch presentations and half pitch presentations or half half product presentations. People hate having a CEO in a room because they're like, damn, CEO is going to interrupt, start asking questions before I can get all the way through my presentation. Well, actually, what does that tell you? But it tells you, number one, that he didn't care about everything you said up to that point in time. And what he interrupted, John, was what he really cared about. I think that is a great example or situation that Chris has just said at the very end of that clip, mm. Mike, which mm. brings light to light this, this lesson or this technique, isn't it? When you are in a uh, situation, it could be a boardroom with a CEO, or in fact, let's bring it back to the dining room table and you're trying to put across a point of view and your kid or your child is, is orientating or continually bringing back to one thing that's in their mind. That's the thing that, that really matters to the other party, isn't it? And I think I love the idea of sitting down and giving uh, another party in the conversation, the opportunity to tell you what it is that they really care about. What is the problem that they're trying to solve. Because then, as Chris Voss says, it points you or me in this situation towards the right solution that's within my arsenal, rather than me pitching to you, Mike, my greatest values. Instead, if you tell me the value that you're looking for, and I know that it's within my arsenal, suddenly we can start coming together because the value proposition fit really exists there. Yeah. I mean, it could be like, let's say you're a restaurant owner and you sit with some of your customers and say, Hey, what do you really appreciate, uh, about the, the restaurant? You know, you come here regularly and you're thinking as the chef, I put so much effort into, uh, sourcing the food from, from locally, uh, local provenance and all this sort of stuff. And they might say, Oh, we just think this place is so charming. The atmosphere in here is so nice. And as the chef, you'll be like, what? Oh. <laughs> but it's so good because you're like, I didn't think. I thought it was, you know, uh, it was the 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 food, but they might say it's the ambiance. The point here is having a conversation where you invite your counterparty to actually express to you the value that you create invariably will give you some new insight in how they perceive what you do. And it's almost guaranteed, isn't it, Mark? Not to be exactly the same as you think it is from your perspective. But yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? You and I have used this technique somewhat with um, clients and partners in the past. You go out and talk to the end user or the other party in order to determine whether your, your theory or your hypothesis is in fact correct. So talking to another party, in this case, maybe we talk about a consumer, like you say, maybe a restaurant uh, attendee, talking to them and understanding what stands out and is relevant to them reveals perhaps something surprising Mm -hmm. that then saves you a lot of time, effort, or money because you're going after you're chasing the wrong lead. Instead of investing more money into the source, you're instead considering how you continue ramping up the ambience, the, the atmosphere of that yeah. restaurant. And remember, just because you think your value is going to the markets and sourcing the food, to use this example, um, 
the way your customers at your restaurant perceive it might be the ambiance, it might be the location, who knows? The point is like getting that feedback really helps you because you're like, oh my gosh, they love the ambiance of the restaurant. Well, now I know what I need to focus on. And I've got this huge insight, like, do we market the ambience enough? Maybe we're sitting on something that is like an amazing ambience and we just didn't realize that that was what people Mm. actually love. I think being self-aware and checking your assumptions and not just being a victim of wishful thinking is really, really important because we're all humans. We all see things slightly differently. And what Chris Voss in his book, Never Split the Difference, is pointing out is that having the counterparty reveal to you what your value proposition is could be full of insights for you. I mean, powerful stuff, right? Powerful stuff. And as, as Chris goes on to say, if you do start saying the wrong thing, you're going to be tuned out within a matter of seconds. Oh yes. Oh yes. So simply asking the question, what matters to you? Why does it matter to you? And using active listening or using uh, a technique just to hear and understand what that party's saying, it's going to save you so much time. And Mark, I'll tell you what matters for us as we are looking to get the word out uh, to to really share this, this idea of learning out loud together here on the Moonshots podcast. We love it. What matters to us is when you, our listeners, get in there and give us a good review because reviews help us. Uh, be discovered by new listeners who want to come and learn out loud together. And Mark, we got a cracking review this week, didn't we? This is definitely a legendary review, Mike. One that will sit in my mind as as (laughs) one of our top. Uh, Sarah goes vegan from Germany. Thank you so much for leaving us a review in the last week. Uh, Just a, a quick call out to some of the stuff that Sarah left us, Mike. I am hooked Binge listen to 20 episodes over the past week. And even though I've heard and read a few things before, it's amazing to have the major key takeaways from absolutely game-changing innovators and leaders of our times recapped and related to our everyday lives. I mean, Mike, that really (laughs) sums up what we try and do on the Moonshot Show, isn't it? It, It's like Sari sort of entered our minds and and worked out what we're trying to do here at the Moonshots (laughs) podcast. And we're really thankful uh, for that review, Sarah, because that really helps us Um, be connected, to be displayed in people's search results and to populate throughout the podcast universe. And as we explore the universe of negotiations and never splitting the difference, already we've seen that, you know, life really is a bit of a negotiation, Uh, whether we're crossing the road, living our personal or professional lives, there is negotiations to be had every single day. And It all starts with tactical empathy and it gets really good when the other counterparty can reveal to you your own value proposition. But Mark, we've got some more to go, don't we? Yes, this next tactic, this next piece of advice from Chris Voss in Never Split the Difference is a very, very proactive, uh, almost easy to replicate, Mike, I would say, with a little bit of practice. And again, like you say, it can be used in boardrooms. It can be used when you're in the shop with your loved ones. And I think it's a really, really interesting example of how tonality as well as just perspective can be utilized in order to understand and communicate a key point. And this is the idea of utilizing I versus you versus it within communication. So let's hear from Chris Voss really breaking this down for us and explaining to us as well as our listeners how to hold attention. There is a specific design with this label. It's not an accident that it starts with the word it. It is the most neutral way you can make an observation. If you drop in the word you or the I in any point in time in here, it creates a different emotional response. I'll prove it to you. When I was an FBI agent, I wanted to become a hostage negotiator. When I finally qualified to get the opportunity to go down to Quantico, I wasn't really enthusiastic about going to Quantico because I knew that I was going to be there for two weeks. I was going to be there over a weekend, and Quantico is a boring place to be over the weekend. There ain't nowhere to go. There ain't nothing to do. And I wasn't that enthusiastic about it, but I got down there, and I didn't know, but it was the only in-service the FBI had where there were hostage negotiators from across the country and from all over the world. And I was immediately introduced and became a member of this international 
negotiation community that I didn't even know existed. And then while I was there, I started hearing about these guys and gals from the FBI that flew all over the world and working kidnappings. And I kind of heard whispers of these guys and rumors of these guys. And then I find out that these guys were on a scent team. And after you became a negotiator, I might get a chance to be on the scent team. And by the time the negotiation course was over, I knew I wanted to be on the scent team. Now, let me tell you the same story. When you're an FBI agent and you become, want to become a hostage negotiator, you find out that you finally get lined up to go down to Quantico. And you're not too enthusiastic about going to Quantico. Quantico is a boring place. There's not much for you to do over the weekend. But you get down there and you find out that there are negotiators from across the country and from around the world. And suddenly you are a member of an international negotiation community you didn't even know existed. And then while you're there, you start hearing about these guys and gals that are hostage negotiators with the FBI, and they fly all over the world working kidnappings, and you know you want to be a member of the SIM team. Now, the second story felt different, and I changed from an I story to a you story. And every time I used I, it was a distraction, it was a thought interrupt that brought the attention back to me, which under the right context is effective. But this ain't it. But I tell the story again differently. You, and I bypass that part of your brain that I was hitting with I, and I get into your limbic system a little more directly, and I start triggering thoughts, and I start triggering your thinking in a completely different way by using you. So you is an engaging word that reaches out and touches you ever so gently each and every time I use it. So as I, it pulls a different sort of distraction. That's why we very specifically begin to design this from a very neutral point of view, because when I say it, I hit your brain in a different way and I trigger a different kind of thought pattern and you're immediately reacting to the seems, sounds, feels followed by the label. If I hit you, the intention is to hit you in a different way. I can say, I know you're angry and you feel that I get it. Or I can say, what I'm hearing is is you're angry. And right then you think you're an idiot. So completely different design and why we do not teach people to say what I'm hearing is to feed it back. And that is one of the biggest, most frequent thing that a lot of people that have been trained in therapy and psychology and psychiatry, they know, what I'm hearing is that this has been bothering you for a very long time. And you were just turned off by that right away. Because that statement is, I'm a lot more interested in how I see this than how you're reacting. So there's a very intentional design. There's a lot of word choice here. And do not be fooled by the simplicity of this. It's designed to hit your brain in very specific ways. This, this for me, Mark, this is really big because I think we um, unconsciously just use I, you, and it in our vocabulary mm. without actually focusing on uh, or being aware of this idea of how it uh, triggers the brain. Um, and that, that, that exercise he did, it really worked, didn't it? It, it, so there's there's two bits that stand out to me within this, uh, let's call it a tactic or a lesson mm. or a clip from Chris Voss. It is the idea of communicating via a slightly different, um, almost third person, mm. I versus you. Mm. And in turn, that then builds into this idea of communicating a story or a different demonstration, let's say, to the other person in order to reflect, or I think as Chris calls it, label Mm. something that the other person's feeling. So by understanding the the difference, the different tone that comes with using you instead of I, you can then unlock the build that comes with then repeating it back to the other person in a manner that is empathetic to you as the, as the other party. It does feel like a huge shift once you understand it. And again, it's not something that we're ever really taught, is it? No. And, 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 uh, I think subconsciously we sometimes feel things are a bit off when someone says I did this and then I did that. And then you're like, okay, I guess you're pretty important in the world then. Yeah. (laughs) But I, I tell you another time is when something has gone wrong, and then you did this, the, the, the mm. use of you did this has had, there's such implication in the you because that's almost the, the proportioning of blame, isn't it? You did oh, this. Yeah. Th- this is, this is an interesting build. And as Chris says, it, it obviously depends on the situation. You're right. If you're in a, um, 
conflict resolution state, let's say, a communication mm-hmm. where you are providing feedback, it is probably going to be more efficient if you say, well, I have done this, because then it does, it creates that empathy, that understanding well, from the other party, doesn't it? Well, you can go even further than that. Rather than saying, like, if you and I had a problem, don't talk about it as, you know, when you place it in perspective, don't say you did that or I did that. This occurred. It happened. That's what he's really going for because it becomes totally neutral. And I think the build that we need to do here is why is he pushing for this? Because as soon as he was like, oh, I did this and then I went here in Quantico and I, it's like you kind of lose attention because he's just talking about himself. You can't yeah. relate. In the same way, if people are really using you did this and you did that, you're like, whoa, 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 hey, this ain't my fault. I, I'm just doing what I was told, right? That's exactly how you would respond to it. So by referring to it, the situation, rather than you did this or I did this, keeps it objective and prevents emotions blocking people's access to truth, to fact, right? Mm. So what he's really doing is to keep things on a balanced perspective, to keep a neutral atmosphere in a conversation, to keep it objective and just like let's get through the facts and make a logical conclusion and agree a way forward. If you refer to let's say it was a problem. It is a problem. Not what you did is the problem. Mm. The situation, it, rather than you or I. By keeping it neutral, we are able to get to a better outcome because otherwise, if I say, hey, Mark, you didn't turn up for the for the podcast, you did this and you put in the wrong link or whatever, Like as soon as I do that, you can feel the attack and then you're yeah. going to start defending, Right. But actually, Whereas, we just want to get a good show together. So, like, it was a problem that we didn't have the right link. That's it, just it, objective. It, yeah, it, it feels more. It, it feels like a result can come a lot easier, actually, doesn't it? Yeah, because you remove the reliance or the blame on the other person, or or on either person's, as you say. If you remove the um, the individual focus of I or you and relating more situationally, Mm -hmm. then it does. It feels more um, accomplishable that you can get past it. You can replace it. And I would say, Mark, that it doesn't matter what you or I did, that what we're getting from Chris here is a really big tip. If you keep it in those situations as it, what you do is you enable both parties to get to a clear, simple, practical negotiation. If you introduce the you, you're making it emotional and in those those awkward situations, it becomes a blocker. Now, what's mm. really fascinating about what he was saying, though, is when you do want to use this is when you want to really connect with someone and say, I understand you are feeling frustrated. I understand you feel angry because you're acknowledging the negative. You are actually tipping the hat and connecting with them because that's what they are feeling. And then you can move on to, wouldn't it be good if we could get a solution to the problem? It it is a challenge. I know. I understand you feel frustrated. Now that's acknowledged. Let's move on and let's talk about how we fix it. Isn't it interesting when you start breaking down these type of structures and Mm. approaches, how much sense they make, but how hard or maybe how much we've almost disregarded in the past just from lack of awareness. There's certainly been times for me throughout my career or, or even to family and friends where I've probably used tones perhaps accidentally that Mm. are incendiary that are frustrating for the other person to hear that I just didn't really think about because I had an subconscious 
uh, blame. <laughs> yeah, against them. frustration. That's and it's frustration. Emotional. Yeah, yeah. And 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 it's like the impact of those three really really small words. You. That's three letters. It. That's two. And I. That's one. Yeah. Depending on when we use them, can really affect the engagement. Now, when Chris Voss was saying, "I went to Quantico," you really did kind of tune out. But just telling yeah. the same thing when you go to Quantico, this is what you experience. You're like, oh, okay, I can see myself doing that. When he's saying I, you're like, well, that's just him doing it. Yeah. And yeah. When, when you want to keep it objective, it is a problem. We need a solution to it rather than you did this or I did this. Because in the end, if you want the solution, at a certain point, you have to stop worrying about who did what and whose fault it is. Because if you stay stuck in the fault and the blame, as you were just pointing out, it's very hard to get through because people are too emotional, aren't they? Yeah. And then it impacts negatively, uh, perhaps in the long run as well. Yeah. Maybe you you want to make them uh, uh, suffer for what you perceive as their mistake. You want to, you want to like extract some, some, some payback when that might block you from coming up with like actually the best solution to go forward. Well, like you said earlier, today's uh, issues are caused by yesterday's problems. Right. Right. So again, what I'm hearing and learning from Chris Voss in today's show on Never Split the Difference is again, like you say, consistent to Mark Manson as well as Robert Greene, which is having an awareness and appreciation, let's say empathy for those other individuals around you. Once you've got an awareness or a consideration of those people and know what really matters to you, you can then utilize some of the lessons within the powers of Robert Greene to then go out and live quite a productive or or positive or effective life. It seems to me, Mike, throughout this master, uh, without this uh, mindset series, we are starting to create those building blocks of having a really solid uh, coordinated structure towards mindsets, aren't we? We are. And I mean, th- 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 we've deliberately gone after some pretty interesting uh, angles here. I mean, we we wanted to go for um, some of the things that are less spoken about. I mean, I, I would have to say like never giving up and resilience, which are the classic David Goggins themes. Universally, everyone loves it. Uh, what I think we've done here is put together a little package of ways to think about the world um, that are a little bit unusual. They force a reconsideration. M- Mark Manson has, has really come back with a, a very powerful look at values. Robert Greene is like, we are, here's the animal spirits of the world in which we work and here's the best way to make them work for you. Chris Voss is like, everything's a negotiation. These are like these fundamental things that can affect how you perceive the world around you. And that's the most powerful thing. Mindset, it's totally within your control. There are not many things in life that you control, but your thoughts and as a proxy of that, your mindset is totally within your control. And the discipline to explore ideas like this is what makes us stronger, what makes us better, and gives us the very best chance of being the best version of ourselves. And with that being said, Mark, we still have one more, and this could be one more tactic from Chris Voss in his book, Never Split the Difference. And this one could be the Jedi mind trick. What do you think? Yeah, this could be the biggest uh, uh, piece of advice, tactic, or reveal that Chris Voss has in his book. And it might be something that some of us have heard before. I think it's a fantastic little technique, exercise. It can even be a little bit of fun to really dive into understanding value propositions, the pains of another person, as well as understanding where the other individual is coming from. So without further ado, let's hear one more time in today's show with Chris Voss about the stealth power of mirroring mirroring, and how it's a Jedi mind trick. The, the quickest, easiest, simple bailout skill that will never fail you, never, 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 never fail you, especially when you're thrown off, when you're off track, when you've lost your emotional bearing. Mirrors are there for you. They work with the least amount of brain power. That's why they will, they're always there for you. 
So we're we're preparing for one of these trainings in a very early day. No, it wasn't one of these trainings, but it was our training in our very early days. Yeah, corporate training. And we're supposed to put together notebooks. Actually, we're supposed to put together three ring binders. But in my head, those terms are synonymous. And he's putting this stuff together. And I ask him if he's got the notebooks ready. And and he knows we're supposed to be putting three ring binders. And I'm saying notebooks. He doesn't know what's what's in my head, actually. You know, are you thinking something like this when I say notebooks? You know, yeah, who knows? Basically. But, you know, this could be a, this is not a three ring binder, is it? This is not a three ring binder. I don't know. I don't know what's the matter with him. I don't know why he can't read my mind. But anyway, so I say, are the notebooks ready? And he goes, what do you mean by notebooks? So what do I say? Goddamn notebooks. Yeah, exactly. Goddamn notebooks, right? <laughs> you say it's much clearer then, right? Because the word notebook is so self-explanatory that if you don't understand exactly what I mean because I choose my words so well, then you're an idiot. It's the same way I ask for directions when I'm in Paris. What do you mean you don't know where the Eiffel Tower? Where's the Eiffel Tower? You know, I only say it again louder. So he mirrors me. He goes, notebooks? I go, yeah, three ring binders. <laughs> and, you know, that's why the mirrors are the great bell you're out of the corner t- tool. Somebody's not on the, right, on the same sheet of music. It's either you or it's them. A quick mirror always causes, always, 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 always causes people to restate it another way. It's especially effective with assertives, because we figure if you're unclear, we just need to talk more. I love this idea of mirroring and how when you mirror back to people, it forces them to restate the idea, but in a different way. Totally unaware of this, but that was kind of neat, wasn't it? It, it's not a technique that I'd encountered before, or at least, uh, here you go, let me say it again. It's not something that I've consciously encountered before, but it does make so much sense, doesn't it, Mike? Just uh, enabling Mark, you. Mark, 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 does that make sense? <laughs> I think it does make sense. And let me tell you why, Mike, because it feels... <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, it does, doesn't it? Because it feels very... Uh, open, it encourages the other party, the one doing the speaking, to expand or build upon their points that they've just Did you said. notice when I did it to you then, you, you, you felt compelled to explain? Exactly. I felt compelled to explain. I felt compelled to build because you had asked me quite an open question. Oh, Mark, is this, is this what, what is it? Hmm. So your natural instinct, I think, is to continue conversing and explaining it so the other party uh, knows exactly what it is you're saying. But I'd say that, that that's an unconscious behavior, isn't it? Very unconscious, which is kind of what the big subtext to a lot of what Chris Voss talks about is these are things that you do subconsciously. Why not use them consciously to get a great outcome for both parties? Well, do you think you can get a good outcome from both parties? Mark, I do think you can get a good outcome, <laughs> and here's why. Uh, really, really neat thinking, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is, and and it's it reminds me of one of the biggest challenges that exists within business, but I would assume also around the family dinner table, not all being on the same hymn sheet, or as Chris Voss says, on the same sheet of music mm. when everybody's going in a slightly different direction, even if it's just very, very minor, very subtle at this point. Maybe somebody thinks the meeting's on uh, Tuesday at 11 as opposed to Tuesday at 12. Something quite small then becomes a huge deal the closer and closer you get to the deadline. And I think the same is true within a, a family ecosystem as well. Without all being on the same page, you breed insecurities, anxieties, frustrations, eventually arguments, maybe even worse. Maybe yeah. you lose the business, maybe you fall out. All these small little things from not being aligned. And I think, I'd, I would argue that sometimes in our lives, we tread the path with, of least resistance, don't we, Mike? Mm. So rather than seek out confirmation, we're quite happy just to say, oh, you know what, I think, I think they've got it. I think they know what I mean. Oh my gosh. Um, what a, <laughs> and what a mistake because, I mean, you think about this. Um, 
I'll give you like a really kind of like a social example. Think about all the relationships that you've had, uh, all the, of all the friends you've had who've been in relationships that haven't worked out. When I look back at a lifetime of friends and family that have been in relationships that haven't worked, do you know when people talk about couples, they've been together for a couple of years and then they just kind of fall apart, right? I think so much of that is they're not recalibrating. They're not checking in with each other on how you're doing, where do you want to go? And so what happens is, you know, when people say, oh, they just kind of drifted apart. I think that's because they don't recalibrate. They don't mirror. They don't double check in. Where are you going? How are we doing it? Why are we doing it? All of those important questions. And then you only need to be off by a couple of degrees, but over time you end up a world apart, don't you? I I totally agree. I totally agree. It can feel really small at the beginning, but unless you do those uh, check-ins, unless you have that conversation, even though it might not feel like a big deal, if you just start cultivating a bit of a habit or behavior to do that check-in, yeah, you're right. You'll then avoid those those feelings of uncertainty, those feelings of potential frustration, and therefore it'll lead to a much better a period of collaboration, relationship, whatever it might be. I think it is just, again, all comes down to the power of good communication. Yeah. Yeah. What, what a crazy uh, way in which these small things tend to have such big impact. That's another theme of his book, isn't it? Yeah. With this idea of never splitting the difference, it really truly understanding the other person's point of view, or at least taking the time to try and understand and try to have empathy. I think that's where uh, one of the biggest lessons from Chris Foss's book comes through, isn't it? Rather than yeah. disregard the other person, just pause and and maybe work hard at understanding where it is that they're coming from. Yeah. And I think that um, it's amazing that you can do better if you take the time to listen to others first. Isn't that interesting? So it's it's weirdly in your own self-interest to be empathetic. <laughs> yeah. I think that's like, I think that's like such a great twist, don't you? It's such a twist. It's such a twist. And again, as consistent with the mindset series so far, probably something that a lot of us uh, don't spend enough time really digging into. Yeah. So uh, which of these themes has grabbed you? Um, which one has, has piqued your interest? These little tactics, but with big effect. I, I think the mirror, mirroring if I can say it correctly, is the, is the, is the stealth power, isn't it? I think that because that carves out a behavior of reinforcing the other person's point of view and Mm. it gives you with very, very little effort, very little brain power. You don't even have to think up a clever question. You just repeat those last three words, perhaps of what somebody said, it enables you to get onto that same page. And by not being on the same page, boy, have I seen a lot of waste <laughs> oh, <gosh>. of time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. You wanted what? <laughs> what? I didn't know that. What, what about you, Mike? What's what's the key uh, lesson that you're finding from Chris Voss's book? Listen, I just think the use of I, you, and it really, that really got me as like these small, like three letters, two letters, one letter. Um, but mm. like can change the perception, the emotion of a discussion so dramatically. Um, really great. It's like when you put it all together, it's all these little things, like they're really a big deal, aren't they? They, they totally have that compound interest. Small Indeed. little things that we can all do pretty, pretty actively, pretty easily. Uh, it just takes that little bit of, of preparation can, can have such a huge impact. Well, there you have it. Well, Mark, thank you uh, so much for joining me on this uh, little adventure, shall we say, that had a big effect. And thank you to you, our listeners, our moonshotters, all of you who are working hard to be the best version of yourself. And the way we're doing that is we're learning out loud together. And today in show 169, we did that with Chris Voss and his book, Never Split the Difference. He started by this first principle, if you will, that life truly is one big negotiation. And the starting point is tactical empathy, a big moonshots theme. And if you can go out in these discussions and invite 
your counterparty to reveal the reason why you create value, then you really are on the right track. And make sure you hold the right attention. Use these three, two, or one character words to great effect. I, you, and it, they have the power to hold attention with your audience. And if you want to step it up for your Jedi mind trick, it is mirroring to make sure that you have that true connection, that true empathy, and to push your end user, to push your conversational partner to go in and to explain why you guys can reach a great outcome. And great outcomes is what we're all about here on the Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap.